Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 321 for Monday, October 4th, 2021. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, as recently, it's Paul Kent. <laughs> How are you doing, Mr. Kent? I'm doing pretty good, man. You know, it's it's that interesting time of year. You know, it's the, it's the change time, right? So yeah. we're coming out of that vibrant summer, as weird as it was, and we're heading into a fall with kind of... And unknown, you know, what's going to happen. So a lot of the outdoor stuff is rapidly, we have our last one yeah. coming up this Friday night. And um, I'm, I'm left with, we don't know where we are. You know, we don't, we don't know our, you know, what the winter is going to be like. I've shut down our indoor gigs. We're not going to take those indoor gigs. Um, the conversations for rebooking have a unusual level of, pause on them, you know, con- you know, caution from, from booking people. Like we don't know what's going to be next year. Right. Yeah. Um, it's just, uh, it, we're, it feels like we're heading into an area of uncertainty without, without like a lot of clarity as to where things are going. How about you? Uh, much of that. We had two bitter pill gigs this weekend, which I'll, I'll talk about, but we, you know, they were both outdoors. They were our last gigs in for, in for the foreseeable future anyway i think we've got some stuff booked in january uh here on the seacoast of new hampshire which is sort of our 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 home if you will we have one more gig uh in a couple of weeks over at uh claremont opera house which is sort of on on the other side of the state um but uh and then that's our that that is our last one for a while i think we've got some january dates on the calendar but our plan is to uh, so that we are not heading into limbo. Our plan is that we're going to go spend a weekend uh, actually here in the studio rehearsing and fine tuning a lot of the new songs that we've brought into things this summer. And then a uh, weekend in December, we're going to go not here. We're going to head over to the noise floor and record these, um, these songs and, you know, track them and put on the record. So, oh. Yeah. So, I mean, there's that, that's happening and it's, it's good. It it's, but yeah, the, the, I mean, the gig thing we, we've, and we've had like you, you know, we've had a spent spectacular summer. We got mm-hmm. through, we got through the summer without having a gig rained out. And by the skin of our teeth, we were driving to the show yesterday. Um, and Saturday's gig was fantastic. And I'll, I have some things to share about that because we had a sub, but I'll tell the story in reverse order. But we had, um, on the way to the gig, the rain starts. And it's like, oh, crap. And this is at this Eastman's farm where we've played a bunch over the summer. We play, we set up on a porch uh, that is covered, but the people generally uh, are not on the porch with us. They could be if we were to set up sort of in a different configuration, but they're out in the grass and uh, on, at tables and stuff. So they would definitely be subject to, you know, what's happening in the sky. So as we got there, it's like, oh, well, did we finally, did we out, did we outrun our luck? Right. Y- you know, with, mm. with never having a, a rained out gig. And uh, we made the decision. They said, look, you know, it's up to you if you want to play. Um, obviously, you know, we get paid, which is always good for the band, especially going into the studio. The money's good. And uh, but we also like to play. And so we, you know, they said, but it's up to you. And we decided, well, if we set up on the porch and face a different way, then people could also sit on the porch and we can make this work. But in order to do that, we probably should do it, you know, more low key. So let's reconfigure on the fly and do this, you know, acoustic style where, um, you know, I wouldn't use full drums. I would use my cajon and we would just kind of make it a lighter, you know, lower key thing volume wise. And so that's what we did. And it, it, I kind of, I have two cajones that I, that I bring two of these pitch slaps. One is much smaller than the other. And I think I mentioned at the beginning of the summer that I hadn't really found a place to use this smaller one because 
when I'm playing with monkey fist or whatever, a three, you know, three set night, I, I definitely want the larger one to have a little more resonance and, and a, a, a fuller sound. Uh, but for these bitter pill gigs, when I play drum kit and Cajon and I go back and forth between them, it's nice to have the smaller one. And I've really been using that and enjoying it at the gigs. Uh, this weekend, I brought the larger one to both gigs. One, because the Saturday gig was a private party. And I thought, you know, we might get there and there's no room for a drum set. Like, I have no idea what this party is going to be. You know, it turned out they wanted to rock. And so it was great. Like, we mm -hmm. set everything up. But, um, and I, as I was leaving on Sunday, I thought, I almost swapped it out and thought, you know, I feel like this is one of those decisions I would look back on and regret. And I don't know why I felt that way. We really weren't expecting rain for several more hours. And then of course, you know, we got there and made this decision. It was like, Oh, thank goodness. I have the bigger one. Like I can, I can do the whole thing without hating this. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> pretty much the moment we finished setting up the rain stopped for the next three hours. And so we could have reconfigured. And I even joked after we got set up, I'm like, Oh dude, the rain stopped. We look at the radar. It's like, Oh yeah, it's over. I'm like, you know, let me go get my drums out of the car. Cause they were just right there. And we'll set them up. And obviously everybody was like, no, 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 no. We're like, we're all, we're not moving things around. I'm like, yeah, no, no, we're not moving things around. But it was interesting because, and the gig went well. It like, everything was nice. That one, I really enjoy playing acoustic gigs. I mean, you know, I've played gigs with Monkey yeah. Fist over the years. Um, me. What's that? And with me. And with you. Right. Yeah, exactly. No, I, 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 I really enjoy it. They are a completely different animal, especially from my perspective. I'm literally playing a different instrument, but I hear differently. You know, I, the harmonies are easier to blend because I'm literally standing next to the people that I'm singing with as opposed to, you know, a, half a stage away and those sorts of things. And so it's a it's a different thing. And I think I mentioned when we played Hippie Hollow earlier this summer that it that was like our best vocal rehearsal we'd ever had because it mm. it allowed us to blend and we weren't even singing directly into mics we were just singing into the air and uh, so that was the place with those killer earthworks mics and so um, you know so that it, I I definitely enjoy and enjoyed yesterday's gig but after such a great gig on Saturday I, it really was hard for me to shift my mindset out of I'm not going to be playing drum set today like I I. I guess I was really looking forward to playing the kid again. We had a great gig. I played well. Everybody played well. It sounded good. We, you know, it was like, oh man, I wanted to do that again. <laughs> um, and I didn't get to, but that was okay. Uh, the gig went well and, and it all worked out, but um, yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, Saturday, we had a sub for bitter pill, which is, the first time that's ever happened, our guitar player, John, uh, had a booking with a different band that was, you know, kind of already in place when, when this thing came up and he said, well, I could get, you know, Jimmy Doherty to, to sub for me. And none of us knew Jimmy. And, uh, he's like, no, he'll be fine. And he came and met us at one of our gigs earlier this summer and even sat in for a song. And I was like, okay, like good, nice guy. Great man. He prepped, <laughs> he knew everything. Like he, Amazing. yeah, it was, you know, we, we kept joking throughout the gig, like, you know, John, who like Jimmy's the new guy, you know, um, it, that, that's not how we actually felt like, but it, it, like, it was our way of saying to Jimmy, like, wow, you know, you've really stepped up and he played guitar in the band. He wasn't just filling in. He was, you know, he was there. And I mean, obviously we were all aware of the fact that this was his, we didn't rehearse with him. You know, he didn't know what was going to happen in some of these changes. So we were all very much like communicating with him like, OK, yeah, now is the time to solo. Now is the time to do this and just confirming with him. So he wasn't, you know, left out to pasture and yeah. it, which is what I would hope anybody would do with a with a sub. But he was just so well prepared. Like I would give him a look like, all right, there's a weird thing about to happen. And he kind of nod his head like, yep, I, I got it. Thank you. Yep. We're there. And it was he really Amazing. did a bang up job. Yeah. Yeah. It was so, so that was good. And it was, you know, this was a private party. It was for, uh, some people kind of, you know, halfway across the state, uh, that, that, uh, had seen the band at, at another gig and liked us. And, but these were, yeah, it was kind of like uh, a lot of biker folk there and like just salt of the earth. So, you know, great people to play for great people yeah. in general, you, you know, they were just really down to earth 
and just having fun. There was, there were things got a little weird when I started investigating what was going on with their cornhole tournament. That, that seemed super serious. And I didn't want to get in the way of what was going on over there, but everything else, everybody was really friendly and, (laughs) and and really uh, great people to play for. And so, you know, they were a very welcoming crowd. I would say they were a forgiving crowd, although they didn't have to be. The band played really well. And uh, I, but I think they would have been a forgiving crowd. And we certainly all knew that. And it was just one of those gigs where the band played really like we all played well. We probably all had, you know, one more beer than we might at a, at a normal gig. Cause it was just kind of loose and the breaks were longer and that sort of thing. And that, that loosened everybody up a little bit, which wasn't a terrible thing. You know, nobody got, nobody was sloppy or anything and everybody was okay to drive home and all that. But it was just, you know, it was it, the, the, we were a professional band that was allowed, you know, to kind of back off a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And it it made for a great day and a great show. Um, it did make me realize that, you know, we have the perfect lineup for this band. I mean, like I said, Jimmy did a phenomenal job. And if we need a sub again, my goodness, like he would absolutely like for any band, if I needed a sub, he'd be the guy I would call. I, 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 I really, I want to talk to him and and find out how, uh, you know how much prep time he actually spent because yeah. It, yeah, he like, he really knocked it out of the park, but you know, like when we all got together on Sunday, it was like, yeah, okay, this is like, now we're, this is it. This is good. This is good. So that it was interesting. It's, uh, you know, a sub and an original band is a, a different kind of thing. And, mm-hmm. um, and it, it worked, but it, I did not know how well it would work. So yeah, it was good. It was fun. I get it. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. We, um, I had two acoustic gigs. One was okay. a really quiet Thursday night. Not too many people came out and, and, uh, you know, whenever that happens, a, I kind of, you know, remind myself that even though I, and, and these are all up in the Bay area. So, uh, I remind myself that to stay humble, <laughs> right? uh, yeah. so, which is a good thing. And, um, but also I use these things to play material and, you know, see how it goes over and see sure. if people, you know, and, you know, and you look for the subtle things, you look for people kind of like stopping what they're doing and listening for a second or nodding their head or singing a you know, phrase along or something like that, you know, get a little subtle things to let you know if you've, if you picked a good song for you that, uh, that work out. Yep. And then the next night, I had a really fun night playing that monthly coffee house gig, the sing along gig. I do a, about a little over an hour of whatever I want, and then we, you know, we do kind of some fun, you know, familiar things. Added a couple new ones. Uh, just went fun. Great feedback. Definitely pumps me up. And then the house rockers played a wedding. So you know, we're kind of talking about interesting gigs and great crowds. Weddings are interesting, aren't they? You know, you get. Yeah. Well, I mean. <laughs> It's Sometimes. not about, it's not about you, right? Like that's the thing with a wedding. It's yeah, they're weird. Yeah. 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 They have like, every time I book a wedding, the band kind of collectively rolls their eyes. Like, Oh, it's gonna be a long day. You know, all the kind yeah. of things that experience, you know, and, uh, but it'll be a decent pace. A, but, uh, but, 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 and this was a wedding of someone who knew us. And a couple other people who were the guests knew us, and it was. But it was kind of like what you were describing about your gig. It was a great group of people. Um, we. So not not a typical to, wedding where you're coming in as just the you know a cog in the wheel sort of here you do your part and stay away and you know like that that traditional wedding. This doesn't sound like that. Like the, you were yeah, and t- you were amongst them. Yeah. We were amongst people who were ready to have a good time and, you know, that there was a connection. A couple of people in the wedding party, you know, like Nick's daughter was one of the people in the wedding party. So there was some connection. But over, like, you know, of 185 people, you know, 10 may have, might have known us, right? Oh, but okay. Um, all right. Okay. It wasn't like they were all house rocker fans. It was, you know, younger people, people in their 20s getting married. But, um, yeah. And to your point, when we started the gig, I was prepared – uh, you know, the, the dinner went late as they always do. The, the toasts went over as they always do. And, you know, we, we end up playing about 30 minutes later than we were originally booked to oh, do, which is fine. Wow. That never that's, happens. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, because the venue but, usually has a tight curfew and that's the end of that. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you get to know a lot about a wedding in the first 15 minutes. So yep. I was prepared to be exactly what you said. It's not about us. And right. remember, right. You, usually these public gigs that we do, it is about us. And we've kind of built our whole show about it being about us. And we are the leaders of this party that's about to happen. But in this, I, you know, very, you know, I wrote a good set list, felt good about it, you know, put a lot of stuff knowing that people like to dance at first. And then at the very end and in the middle, you know, cake cutting takes people's minds away and side conversation and all that type of stuff. But, you know, my, my thought was let's come out with some great stuff and let's make sure the party ends high at the end. Um, so, but you know, it wasn't be a, a lot of on mic announcements. It wasn't going to be a lot of exaltations for people to clap or any of that type of stuff. And, uh, but the, the audience revealed themselves to us quite early on. They were there to have a good time. They were ready. It'd been long enough day of sitting through the ceremony and the toast and, you know, going through a long dinner process and it was just great. So I am always struck with, with when a good, when a good wedding gig happens and you feel as though you have contributed a great memory, you know, like people left that wedding going, man, that was a great party. That was a great band. We've added to the, you know, these people starting their life together. We've added something of great value to them. And, you know, they had asked for our set list to put in their, in their wedding book, you know, whatever their photo book and that type of stuff. It was a very nice feeling. That's awesome. The yeah. band had a great time. The you know, reception was good. So this was a great wedding. This was a really, really fun one. That's cool. That's outstanding. Yeah, yeah no, that but I've had the other ones though. I've had the ones where, of course, you know, you know, aunt, aunt Bess says turn down and do you, do you know the Sinatra tune? And what do you mean? You don't know the Sinatra tune? And you know, we've had those as well. Yeah. 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 I, um, I am still, it sounds like you waited, like they waited to have, you were, I don't mean to put this on you. The schedule was that you started playing after dinner. So a traditional sort of old school wedding thing. Is that, is that how this one went? Is that right? After at, there were toasts after dinner. So the father of the bride yeah. and then the best man and the and gave toasts. And actually they were running so far behind in dinner. They started those toasts while a few people were still in line to get their food. So, Absolutely. you know, they were trying to get it back on, back on. Uh, yeah. It'll never get back on track. It's, it's not how it works. I, my daughter has been doing a, a, an internship at a, a wedding venue or an event venue where they do lots of weddings here in new England. And she, uh, tells me that most of them now are running like, like, and I've played a couple of these um, and I've attended a couple of these um, where the band starts the moment people enter the reception room before dinner and the speeches start before dinner. Some of them mm. happen before dinner. Some of them happen during dinner and they, you know, they just work it out so that you have like an hour's worth of dancing when food is served, food is served. So no, now dinner is never late, right? Because the band just knows to play until somebody says dinner served. All right. Last song for this set band finishes yeah. band eats first, which is always yep. a bizarre thing, but it makes a lot of sense. You know, so band t takes off, goes to wherever, you know, their green room is. They eat while the people start eating. There's more speeches happening at, you know, throughout dinner and then as dinner is finishing, the band takes the stage again and boom, off it goes. So you really get that party vibe. And I would reckon, I know most of the time when you're playing a wedding, you know, somebody else is the one that has organized the flow of the event for the evening. It's rarely, sure. rarely do you even get asked for your opinion. You're usually told, here's how yep. it's going to work. But I would say having attended and played some of these and then also attended and played the more traditional ones. If you can even suggest folks playing, you know, in that order, when people come in after the cocktail party, boom, have the band playing while the people are entering that room. It starts the party. Uh, it really, it's a great flow to cool. things. Yeah. It seems like it's becoming the new normal, at least around here. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll see if it, if it catches on, but it definitely, it makes it more of a party as opposed to this long drawn out thing that then at the end, it's like, oh my gosh, now we have a band playing like, oh, mm. right. You know, like it's, yeah. Yeah. So, cool. yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that have been some of my favorite conversations that we've had over the years. Yeah. Song selection is one of them. Um, band decision-making has been another one because I learned a lot about myself and, and, you know, 
I, I hear reflections back from you that really help me kind sure. of, you know, figure out how I, how, what are my natural inclinations? What are, what am I stuck in my own dogma in when I'm trying to, yeah. when I'm trying to sell things to the band? We're going to go through <clears throat> a process uh, with the house rockers, with this downtime that we have. So, you know, the new bass player is working out really well. He's adding a lot cool. You know, he's just a good player. He's got a great tone. He's a, he's a, he's a smart guy. So let's assume that he's going to be happy with us and we're going to be happy with him. We're going to start a process of, of uh, figuring out what to do with our song list. So we have a good song list, but coming out of COVID, because we didn't have a lot of time to rehearse, what we did was of the 200 songs we probably have, we picked about 40 of them that we considered our A-list. What did okay. you say to me the other day that, uh, Hey, your that, fastball. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Uptown funk is, is the yeah. sweet home Alabama of the, of the right. That's so right. So yeah. we picked, we picked 40 uptown funks basically, right. Sure. Sure. That, that were kind of, you know, slam dunk. We play great. They go over great. You know, sometimes we add our own little twist to them to make them uniquely ours or interesting anyway, but we've, we've played those over the summer. Maybe we've added five, you know, that we pulled back and I would just say, Hey, does everybody remember this one? Everybody was, yeah, no rehearsal, just threw it in the set list and, and, you know, learned what we learned from the song. We just did that all-star, you know, the smash mouth tune. Yeah. We haven't touched that in two years. Um, I knew it was a younger crowd at this, at this, uh, even though that's not technically a younger song anymore, no. but, um, <laughs> but, uh, it went over great. You know, we, we were talking, I went to see the Jonas brothers the other night, uh, with my daughter and, and my wife, uh, and, we were talking about, she asked, she's like, do you play any Jonas Brothers in the wedding band? I'm like, no, not yet. But I see that coming. Like, you know, those people are the, the, the fans of that. Are yeah. like, that's like, you know, they're, that's three years away, I think. Well, so. remember, before we had the conversation several weeks ago about you don't just flip the light and you're a wedding band, that there's a lot of things that go into it. We started a process before COVID shutdown where we're like, we need to have a, a focus. On, so this would have been 20... In 2019, anticipating the summer of 2020, where of the new songs we're going to learn this year, let's tilt it towards newer stuff, right? And so we had some Ed Sheeran stuff, you know, we had uh, you know, kick kick by the ocean, yeah. you know, that type of stuff. So we were we were trying to get we heard there the Jonas with our Brothers song play list. that the other night, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we were trying to get there from a from a repertoire standpoint. And uh, as as one step in the process, but anyway, so the point to all this, Dave, is uh, we want to refresh. So so we we have two hundred songs in our book, and that'd be two hundred songs that I have horn charts for, you know, that we've worked on to some degree or played to some degree over the years. We've been playing for the last four months the A list of those songs, the ones that are you know, and and I would say our sets flow great. The energy builds. You know, I've been really happy. We have a we have a two hour show you know, that flows really great and a three hour show where we have a little bit more, um, uh, flexibility in the, in the top end of the show to do, you know, maybe not, not as much dance song, you know, other, other things when it's a longer show like that, like the, yeah. those are usually concert series shows. So we're thinking about an approach given the constraint that we're not going to have a lot of rehearsal time. So Nick says, well, let's just go back into those 200 songs and let's bring back some, some other ones. Yeah. And, you know, that made sense to me on one level, but on the other level was like, but if those songs were A-level songs, we'd already be playing them, right? So there's a reason they didn't make the cut, right? And so, you know, what does that mean to everybody? That was my re reflection to it. There's a couple of good ones that we can bring back, but for sure, and surely we'll get ourselves moving forward. And he was like, but that's the path of least resistance. That's a good point as well. So we're kind of going down that path. And then I'm trying to think about how do we... How do we make that often painful conversation about new song suggestions better? And the trombone player in my band is a really smart guy, Mark Proudfoot. And he was like, well, if we all can agree that our shows are going great and the flow of the shows are going great, why don't we put in a, like a, a rule? So he's a programmer, right? So he's putting, yeah. in, he's yeah. putting in logic that um, is like, all right, if you want to suggest a song, what song would it replace in the existing flow? That is, I, that, I love that question. Yes. Interesting, right? You no, know, I, I've asked that in Fling before when we were having some set list friction. It was like, okay, well, the last gig, the show went well. The crowd liked us. So what song we want to put in this, this song? Okay, great. Fine. What song, what, which one gets sacrificed? 
You got because yeah. yeah, because we can't play for four hours if we're only playing for two. So got to, you know, got to balance it out. I love that he, he I mean, clearly we think the same way. So I like this. Yeah, this no, is good. Mark, Mark is a really bright guy and, and it's yeah. a good thing. But here's the problem. Um, even a simple question like that seems like common logic and sense to Mark, to you, and to some degree to me. But when we ask that question of the band, the way that they hear that comes back to, you haven't seen my fastball, right? Comes back to, no. Um, but at that point in the show, we really could take a left turn and do something like this. So one guy in the band said, you know, we get out, we have five horns. Why aren't we playing in Chicago? That would be a good place to put a Chicago song. And then three guys moan and say, but no one can dance to Chicago, right? One guy said, we're from the Bay Area. You know, people want to hear more Tower of Power. And we're all like, Yep, Tower Power can be good and funky, but it's really not dance music. It's cool horn music, yes. but it's, you know, it's not, you know, great grooves for dancing. And so you get back into that place where everybody's worldview of what will work and what won't work and what's satisfying the audience comes from a really pure and holistic place. Everybody thinks that they've got something really good to add. Well, so you need more rules. But then you're going to have more different interpretations of rules. And it's fair. Yeah. So, so that, that's literally where we're going. So the yeah. net net of this goes back to my premise about how democracies and bands are so debilitating to me, right? I, I don't understand how bands get it done. I, I literally, from my viewpoint, and I've, say, I've shared this with you many times, <clears throat> a good, strong person with a good track record of his vision being proven out to being effective is a shorter path to getting shit done, you know, just making decisions and moving ahead. No, it's but true. It, you You're know, not wrong. It it's uh there is an efficiency that happens with a dictatorship, right? And and I mm -hmm. I, I mean that with a benevolent dictatorship too, right? Like it, it you know, um but it's mo and and bands that are doing it for the purpose of being an entertainment business that works great. Uh, you know, like there's, there's never been an issue in uptown celebration that anybody, but Gary is going to make the decision or make the set list or pick what songs we're going to play or any of that. He will at times ask, Oh, Hey, what's the, you know, does anybody have a song they want to play? And then he'll decide whether that is even on the list for rehearsal, let alone does it make it to the set list for the gig. Um, and that works out great because everybody knows that that band is all about being, you know, we are in the business of providing musical entertainment. Do we have fun when we do it? Yes. Do we enjoy each other's company? Yes. Do we play like a band? Sometimes we even do, uh, it, you know, but it, it very much is, this is a business. Now, Gary earned that spot to do that a, by starting the band. Uh, and he maintains that spot by keeping the band well paid, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that's it is, you know, that that's how that works, but it's not, no one plays in that band for some artistic vision. There's like, there's never any thought of that. It's not an artistic thing from that standpoint, we are out there playing the songs that people want to hear. We're catering to a very specific type of audience. Can we have fun doing it? Sure. They're fun songs to play, especially when you got a room full of, you know, a couple hundred people that are just going nuts to hear these songs that they know. But it's, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, we also know that every single gig is not about us. And I think in the house rockers, you have a, a weird blend, not a weird blend. You have a blend. And it is there. There's a part of it that is exactly what you're saying. This, you know, we want to play the songs that entertain the people and they want to dance and yada, yada, yada and all this stuff. But at the same time, the show is about you. Now, and I don't say that in a in a bad way. That's just how you've organized that band. That's how you've built that band is mm -hmm. it is a show about you. And so that then brings in people's well if it's about me shouldn't it be the things that mm. i care about as opposed to it's about me entertaining those people right so i think there's i think this is where that friction point happens where a democracy 
there there is always going to be some level of democracy happening because the 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 show is about you as individuals and as a band not about the crowd right, right. and so this is where i'm saying the reflection of my strengths and weaknesses as a leader so when I started the band, I, and I remember, you know, the, the, the thing I wrote that I posted on Craigslist originally, because I didn't know any local musicians, yeah. was like, you know, here's the deal. I'll do all the work, but I'm going to choose the songs. I was very, it was explicit sure. out there. And, you know, most of the guys who I hired early on, you know, that, that was communicated to them in some way. And as I've shared before, the horns... Their their mindset is largely a sideman, right? I mean, there's never been a really point of friction. But as I've gotten good rhythm section players to play in who are used to being in bands, and what being in a band means is that you have a voice and you have a vote, even if they intellectually signed up for what I was putting out there. And then you're right. Here's where the point of friction comes from. I've been trying to thread the needle for years, ever, Um of wanting their emotional buy-in to things and giving them enough voice to feel connected to the project at all times and some ownership, but still still needing to find a way when I really feel that something is better to do something in the way that I think it is, yeah. of being able to play that leader card. So what comes out is you may have heard the term, um, um, what is it called? Um, benevolent dictatorship, yeah, right? That's what I said earlier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a whole skill set that is is hard. Like, you know, I know leaders who just shut stuff down and say, nope, you know, thank you. But, you know, and they, to some degree, you know, if they're really good at it, they can say no. And everybody goes, yep, oh, that's right. He get, he has the right to say no. But uh, for me, because I'm an empath and I really want people to love being a house rocker, I, I try to find that way where I let it out enough so they feel connected. But, you know, if it really strikes me as something I got to say no to or I got to overrule and that's hard for me to do. So, you know, again, I'm being fairly frank here about sure. what my strengths and, and, and weaknesses as a leader are. And it hurts me to say no, but my gut tells me I really should say no. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's just a, that's just a, a, a struggle that I, you know, am keenly aware. And it's largely come to light from our conversations is like, you know, like you say, your band has a dynamic. You kind of reveal it to me in a different way than I see it sometimes, which has been really helpful. So we're going to go through this with this with this songless stuff. Um, and you called it setless friction. I think we actually named a, didn't, didn't we name an episode setless friction one time? Might have. Like, it's, I've yeah, heard it's, that before. I, I might've said that once or twice before. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, I mean, I, what's, I am, I am a massive control freak, I think. <laughs> and, and I, I, I know there are people out there nodding their heads. Right. So, uh, I am not the only one that thinks this. Uh, and I'm not looking for people to disagree with me. I'm I'm pretty comfortable with the fact that I'm a control freak. But when I'm in a band, there are like there's a, it, it's weird for me because I really enjoy not being the one in charge. Uh, I just I like to play, and so like with Bitter Pill gigs, I you know I I look on the Google Drive the day before the gig, I get the set list. And I, you know, make any preparatory notes or, you know, whatever I might need to do. Uh, and then I go play the gig. And I mean, if, you know, but that doesn't mean that discussion of the set list is off the table. Like yesterday we got to the gig and it was like, well, we're going to change some things up. And OK. And I, you know, threw out an idea or two and it was like, yeah, OK. Like everybody's heard, but everybody just shows up and plays the set list that's there too. It's not like there's, there's this negotiation about it. It's like, yeah, these are our songs. We don't have a ton of songs. So we're mostly playing the full catalog, 80, 75%, mm -hmm. 70% of the catalog at every gig anyway. Um, but even like the order of the songs, like sometimes I'll look at it and be like, I wouldn't have chosen that order. But if I, you know, if I'd asked each person in the band, we get, you know, six different <laughs> opinions on what the order of the set should be. It's like, yeah. if we got to pick one and it's going to be fine. We're going to go play this set. You know, I mean, if there was, I suppose if there was something on the set list where it was like, uh, I, I think that there's a, that's a really bad idea. Somebody would say it, right? Like, you know, wait a minute. We're not prepared for that. That was a disaster. You know, whatever. Did, did we forget? Like, you know, those kinds of things. I don't recall that happening, but certainly 
the conversation is there. It's it's either Billy or Emily who write the set list for for Bitter Pill, and I it goes back and forth. I don't even honestly, I don't even know who wrote the set list this weekend. I just you know, I go to the Google Drive, and there's the list. It's like okay, good to go. Mm-hmm. Do I know all these songs? Yeah, sweet. Off we go. Let's go play the gig. <laughs> um, I like that. I I it, which is weird to me that I'm not overly a control freak about it and fling. I've wound up with more jobs than I have in, in most bands. Like I, I did build the set list for a long time in that band. I, I'm sure it stood still will when we, you know, resume gigging and all that stuff. Um, but again, it was like, somebody just has to do it. It's not, yeah. I, you know, it's just got to get done. And so we just do it and it's fine. So I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I'm the wrong, in many ways, I'm the wrong person to talk with about this because I don't understand the friction and why it has to exist. I, I, uh, I accept that it happens. I've experienced it. Uh, it surprised me the first time I ran into it, but I get it. Like, I, I know that it's a real thing. I know that people really care and they, you know, want to have their voice heard and this, that, and the other thing. And that's, totally valid it i just i don't i I have no ability to empathize with that i suppose it it may not be so much that the friction occurs because of the interest in having the it, it it probably occurs in the way that the that the ideas are rejected you know, it, it probably doesn't occur from the fact that people want to, you know, offer their personal stamp to make something better. That comes from a good place, right? There. I think I think that the friction comes from when, and this is human nature, when people don't feel heard or don't feel valued. And so, if you tell people your idea is not good enough in in a in a you know more or less direct way, yeah, it's going to create hard feelings and therefore lead to friction and lead for side chatters and cancer in the locker room and all that type of stuff. Yeah, that's me. So I, it, I I I'm too direct with those sorts of things. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I see it too and, logically. And yeah, absolutely, and and I and I understand that as well. And then from the leader standpoint, you're kind of like, but guys, don't you see my plan has been working really well, right? Like, you know, but but it's not that that's not the that's not the line that's drawn together. I think that the value, and you know, speaking to people who are band leaders out there, I think that the value is you want people to be connected to your project and and give you you know their creative juice even if it's cover music you want you want enthusiasm for playing the music that's in and often that comes from comes from soliciting you know creative input the 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 skill the thing to have in your bag is the ability to either take the input or 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 reject the input and still have the person walk away feeling really heard yeah. and valued yeah. right that's that's the secret sauce that's the magic where you know because you know it it i think it's a bad leader who thinks they're the only one who has good ideas you want people to give you ideas oh i think you want, you want people, to, people with better ideas than you like exactly but yeah but if you want ideas and if you don't want to cut off that spigot of ideas developing that that ability to graciously accept or graciously reject an idea. That's what will keep the good ideas flowing in, in any creative, in any, in any business endeavor or in any creative human beings don't like being shut down. Right. You know, no, 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 if, you're totally even right. If that, even if that's the nature of your relationship, <laughs> it's still butthurt. And, and that's why you have to be careful because yeah. if you're going to ask for ideas and you never take ideas, you do look like a jerk. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's that it's, it becomes evident very quickly that the only reason you're asking is to placate people and, and you're not actually, you don't care what they actually have to say. It, right. That, and to bring this all the, the way around, yeah. that's good community. Right. If you can bring this all the way into the song you know, discussion. So I said, let's agree what we're doing works pretty good. You know, where, what would you substitute is makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways but I, I just am anticipating some rabbit holes. The challenge is not to add more rules to try and keep people from going down that rabbit holes. It's really more on me to funnel those ideas and accept or reject them. You know, I, again, I don't, you had said you need more rules. I just think that'll create more rabbit holes, right? It, no, it would. I was just saying like, you know, if people were saying, 
when you brought up the Tower Power tunes or the you know the Chicago songs, like okay, well th- that that they're not wrong that those are great songs, but the question would need to be what are the what are the other rules that and what's the filter look like that we have to sift these things through? And right. if it's that it needs to be a good dance song, okay, well does your Tower of Power song is that a good dance song? Does your is your Chicago song a good dance song? No. Okay. Well, we've tried. We put it through the ringer. But we got to this next step and it doesn't pass muster, right? Even as a recorded song, let alone whether or not we play it well, right? So what I think I'm going to do is, to bring this all the way around, what I think I'm going to do is write, a, you know, in business we would call it a mission statement, but I, I, I'm going to write something that reminds people what we are. Yeah, right? yeah, more rules, just presented in a different way than than. Yeah, a, yeah. I'm going to write, you know, yeah. we are a high energy you know, party band. Yeah. Knowing full well that in in my band of eleven people, ten guys and, and one crew guy, uh, we all go to different parties. Right? Uh, <laughs> yes, this is well. That's fair. That's right. But but that gets you. You know, it, it gets a little you closer. A little closer. That's right. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. And that that'll get you there. Yeah, I would love to hear what what folks what you folks think about all this craziness that we've been talking about feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Seriously. I, I want to know, like, how do you handle this in your band? And, mm-hmm. and you know, this is, it, this is an issue for any band that is not strictly a dictatorship. Right. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think if you rewind back, you know, whatever, four or five years, we might, I, I think there might've been a moment where you said, uh, well, the house lock house rockers are a leader led band. You know, we're not a democracy. And I think what we've learned here is that there you're somewhere in the middle, right? You are not strictly a leader led band, nor do you want to be right. But you're also not a democracy, nor do you want to be. There's this, th- this, and I think there's more bands like you than not like you, right? Where there's this, you know, one person has to be the, the final decision maker, the sure. leader, the leader, but we really are all in this together. We are a band, not a collection of employees. Right. And, and so like it, it's different than most businesses in that sense. When, when you're organized the way you are, where you really do want people to buy in and and truly feel like it's their band too, and right. that's a that's a that's a tough thing. I mean, I, I I mean, there are definite parallels to you know non entertainment related businesses here uh, because you you know within any business you want your employees to feel some ownership and and feel some you know the ability to actually make a difference like that. And and that's this is hard stuff. It's not it easy. And most people who play in rock bands are not trained in the art of leading other humans. Mm. Uh, I'm not, I'm terrible at it. I, I, you know, I, I get stuck being the leader cause I'm, I have ideas and I'm willing to take risks at some level. And I would so, say they're not trained in it, but the ones that are extraordinary, the ones where this is a net, when I talk about how, for me, it's not easy to let, a, a, you know, an idea I don't think is right down easy. Yeah. Some people are amazing at that. You literally walk away. You have been shot in the head yeah. and you're thanking the person. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and actually that's a skill that I really admire. You know, that, that's, that, that's a leader of humans. That is someone who, you know, you will follow because you feel so good, even in a negative interaction. Yes. And that's, that's what I would aspire to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, I, I look at, you know, Billy and bitter pill. I mean, he's definitely the leader of the band. There's no, I don't, I think everybody would, it's certainly my perspective of it, but he is such a good collaborator. Like it, 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 there's always room for everyone's idea to be heard. Mm -hmm. Uh, It may, may or may not be implemented in exactly that way, but also it might be like it happens. Uh, And and it's not even a, it's, it's not even a struggle. It's just, yeah, well, here's, you know, he clearly has a vision for this band. It, it's it been informed by lots of things, including the people in the band and, and it's constantly evolving, uh, yeah. you know, but it stays true. I'm sure to his original mission. We were talking about that 
just yesterday as we were setting up when we did the very first show that was called Bitter Pill in in Portsmouth uh, four years ago now, I think that was. And it, like on day one, he said to this group of people that were musicians and actors and artists that were all, you know, conspiring together to put on this show that was just this kind of weird thing. It was a trunk show if you really want to boil it down, you know, but it was, it, you know, it was this um, different kind of thing. And, and I'll never forget it because he said it from the beginning and said it all the way through. He says, I see this as a band. We're organized like a band and think about it like we're all in a rock band together. And that's how this is going to work. And it, it all it, like it, it, that, that message and mission still exists today. It's, you know, it's, it's evolved in many different ways and there's been experiments down different paths and some of them have succeeded and some of them have failed and it's great. And it just keeps on trucking forward and here we are. So I, you know, but I, I think collaboration is a, a big part of that. And some people, like you said, are naturals at it. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Let us know though. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I'd love to hear how you, navigate these waters in your band, whether it's you that are the one that has to be the leader doing the navigating, or if you are the not leader as part of the band, also having to navigate from, you know, from, uh, from your vantage point, we'd love to love to hear about it. Yes, sir. And that's what I got today. You got anything else, man? No, that was right. cathartic. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I could tell you needed to get that off your chest. It's good. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, this kind of stuff is helpful. A, it's, it's, as you talk about things, or certainly as I talk about things, I learn more about them, right? Because it's, that's sort of how, you know, we humans and our brains tend to work, but also it like hearing this from you help me with some, you know, frame things better. And hopefully that's the same for everybody listening. And, but let us yeah. know if there was something where you were like bounding on the pounding on the dashboard, like, Oh guys, you're missing. There's a, there's a better way. We want to know feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Yes, sir. All right. That's what I got. Um, All right, man. Until next week. Oh, no, we're not going to. What do we do next week? Because, you know, I'm going to be gone. Oh, yeah. We'll figure that out. We do have Bob right. Pyle coming on in uh, in two weeks. So excited. Uh, same. Yeah. So, yeah, we might not. Um, we might not record next week. This might be the. Right. We might just come back on the 18th with Bob Pyle. So that'll be fun. Come back strong. All right, man. Always be re always be performing. Thanks. <laughs>